Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for intermediate algebra. This is section 7.4, which deals with equations that are quadratic in form. Initially, when we go to solve equations, they may not appear to be quadratic, or they may even not be quadratic at all. But maybe we can still use our methods of solving quadratics in order to find the solutions. <clears throat> so we're just going to review these for a moment. Hopefully, our factoring skills are very strong, and we know how to factor. The square root method, if I can isolate a, uh, a squared factor, I can use the square root method, take the square root of both sides. But I'm going to remember plus or minus. Completing the square, we're going to use this tool here, 1 half of b quantity squared, add that to both sides, and then revert to the square root method. And last resort would be the quadratic formula. So if we are comfortable with using these materials. When it comes to equations that are quadratic in form, we can use these tools in order to solve them. And the most important one, I feel, is factoring. So make sure your factoring skills are very strong. Let's look at this example here. Here we have a rational equation. And a rational equation is nothing more than a fraction that might have a polynomial or a variable of x in the denominator. And we can see that's what we have here. So when we worked with rational equations before, we cleared the fractions by multiplying through by the LCD. So I want to find the LCD. Well, I know that this uh, denominator is 2x minus 5, and this one is x plus 3. But this, I should factor this before I begin so I can identify what the factors of this denominator are. So I'm going to use a method called the AC method. And that's basically taking A times C of this polynomial, this quadratic. And that gives me negative 30. If I find the factors of negative 30 that have a difference of 1, they have to sum the 1, it would be 5 and 6 have a difference of 1. And it's going to be a negative 5 because 6 minus 5 is a positive 1. Once we've found these, we can factor by grouping. Because we use these values we found to split up the middle term. 6x minus 5x is still 1x, so it, I didn't change its value. So if I factor by grouping the first two terms, I can factor out a 2x. And that leaves me with x plus 3. The second two terms, I can factor out a negative 5. And that leaves me with x plus 3. So we have that common factor. So I can say x plus 3 is multiplied by both 2x and negative 5. So I was able to factor this down to that. And if I wanted to check my factoring work, I could FOIL this out, and I should get that right back. So now if we assess the LCD, I can say, well, I have these two factors in all of my denominators. This is my LCD. So if we recall, when working with rational equations, we clear those fractures fractions excuse me, by multiplying through by the LCD. So now that we know the LCD, I'm going to clear this work so we have a nice clean slate to work with here. Um, another thing I'm going to do before I actually multiply through by this LCD is I'm going to determine domain, or if, if there's any restrictions that I'm not allowed to get for answers. Because since we have x's in denominators, if I ever divide by 0, it becomes undefined. So I'm going to look at my restrictions. Since these are the factors of my denominator, I'm just going to set each of them to 0. If this one's 0, x cannot equal 5 halves. And if this one was 0, x could not equal negative 3. Because if this is negative 3, negative 3 plus 3 is 0. I'm dividing by 0, which is a restriction. All right, so we determined our Restrictions, if any answer that I come up with matches one of those, I have to exclude it because it's not a solution to this equation. So now we're ready to clear this fraction. I'm going to multiply through by this LCD. And for this one, since this is derived from that, it's going to reduce to 1. So I just get 11. Here, I have to use the distributed property. I'm going to multiply both these factors times the first term. The 2x minus 5 reduces to 1. So I have 5 times x plus 3, which is 5x plus 15. Then I'm going to multiply this by the next term. And I'm going to be uh, very aware that this is a negative x over x plus 3. So when I go to multiply it, the x plus 3 is reduced to 1. I have a negative x times this quantity, 
which is going to give me negative 2x squared plus 5x. Now that I've done that, I can see that there's no more fractions. I notice this is x squared. This is a quadratic, and I can solve it using quadratic methods. So let's go ahead and set this equal to 0, because that's how we uh, work with our quadratics. I'm actually going to add 2x squared to both sides. Combine these like terms. I'm going to get 10x, subtract that from both sides of the equation, and then subtract a 15. Well, I have this constant of 11 over here. So that's going to give me negative 4. So setting it equal to 0, maybe if uh, you don't like that I missed, skip some steps, work it out yourself and see that you should get this here. Now that I have this, I can see that they all have a factor of 2. And the smaller my coefficients of a, b, and c, the easier it is to work with. So I'm going to divide all the terms by 2. So I get x squared minus 5x minus 2 equals 0. Now, it's a quadratic, so maybe I say, well, let's try and factor it. Well, there are no factors of negative 2 that have a difference of 5. So factoring it's not going to work. And I can't isolate a squared value, so the square root method won't work. If I use completing the square, it would work, but the middle term is odd. And if I take half of that, I'm going to have 5 halves, which is a fraction. And maybe I don't want to work with fractions. I did all that work to, just to get rid of them. So I'm going to use the quadratic equation here x equals negative b, so we've got to remember to change the sign, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 25, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is negative 2, all over 2 times a. Well, since a is 1, it's 2 times 1. And now I can simplify that. x equals, well, under this radical, we have 25. Negative 4 times negative 2 is a positive 8. 25 and positive 8 is 33. 5 plus or minus the square root of 33 over 2. Now, this is the solution I found. And I go back to my restrictions. Well, I don't have 5 halves, because this is 5 plus or minus the square root of 33 over 2. And I don't have negative 3, because obviously this isn't an integer. So what I can do is I can go ahead and test it in here to make sure that I'm right. But I'm going to be honest with you. To check this answer in this equation is insanely tedious. So maybe you want to check it with a calculator. And I'll leave that for you to do. All right, so that's our solution. We're going to move on to another one where we can use quadratic methods to solve. Now, notice this is a higher order equation. One thing that we should watch for is when we work with quadratics, the highest power is 2. It's a second degree equation. And we can find, at most, two solutions. Well, when I have a higher degree, this number tells me something about the solutions. I can have up to four solutions. Initially, if we assess this and say, well, I recognize 81 to be a perfect fourth power number, and this is the fourth power, what to the fourth power is 81? If you recognize it and say, well, the answer is 3, you only have one of four possible answers. Maybe you recognize that, well, since it's even, an even number of negatives would also be positive. So I could say, well, it's plus or minus 3. Well, now you're halfway there. You have two of possibly four answers. When you have something like this, the first thing to attempt to do is set it equal to 0, just like we did in the last example. So if I take z to the fourth and I subtract 81 from both sides, I set it equal to 0. Now, if I look at it and assess it, I can see this is the difference of squares. Because z to the fourth is a perfect square of z squared. z squared times z squared is z to the fourth. And this is a perfect square of 9. Now, since it's the difference of squares, we have the sum and difference of terms. So I was able to factor it. Well, now I can factor this one even further, because z squared and 9 are also perfect squares. And it's the difference of squares. So this z squared plus 9, I'm just going to leave that alone. But I can factor this one further in the real number system. I get z plus 3, z minus 3, because it was the difference of squares. Now I can use uh, the zero factor theorem or the square root method, because this is a perfect square that I can 
uh, isolate. So let's just use the zero factor theorem. If I set this equal to 0, 0 times anything is 0. And I can say, well, if I subtract 9 from both sides, I can now use the square root method because I was able to isolate that. And if I take the square root, I get plus or minus the square root of negative 9. Well, the square root of 9 is 3, but the square root of a negative or we can think of it as a negative 1, is that value i. There were two solutions in the complex number system. If we look at these, these ones are really easy. What makes this 0 if z is negative 3 or if z is positive 3? So plus or minus 3. If you notice here, I do have four solutions. I have positive 3i, negative 3i, positive 3, and negative 3. I found four solutions to this equation. And I can check those easy enough. 3i squared is going to be, or excuse me, 3i to the fourth will be 81. And 3 to the fourth will be 81. And I'm not going to worry about checking the others because they are conjugates. And if you recall in a previous video, I said if you have a conjugate and it's, uh, or a solution and it's conjugate, if one works, the other one will work. All right, let's look at another method that we can use. Because if we look at this, it is obviously not a quadratic. But it's quadratic in form because if we take this middle term, x to the 1 third, let's think about a standard quadratic. This x, if I were to square it, I would get x squared. So this variable is squared relative to the middle. So let's look at this middle term and say, what would happen if I squared it? Well, I know my rules of exponents. If I square this, I have a power raised to a power. I can use the power rule. I get x to the 2 thirds. Just multiply them together. This and that are the same thing. If I square the middle term, I should get this term right here, or at least the variable. I'm not worrying about that coefficient. So this is quadratic in form because this term is squared relative to that term. So I can do something called substitution. To substitute, we usually use the variable u to indicate we're doing a substitution. I'm going to let u be that middle term. Since the first term is squared relative to that middle variable, u squared minus 2u. I let u be that middle variable. And now if we look at it, well, that's just a quadratic. We can go ahead and solve that quadratic. So that's what I'm going to do. And I recognize that there are factors of negative 8 that have a difference of 2. u minus 4, u plus 2. And now I can solve for u. u equals 4 or negative 2. Now here's where we have to be careful. This is not the answer to the original equation because I did a substitution. Now that I know these values, I have to put them back in to find out what x is. Because I don't want to know just u. I want to know x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let u, which is 4, equal what I substituted it in for, x to the 1 third. Now, to get rid of a 1 third power, hopefully we recall that that's just a, a rational exponent, which is a root. So this would be the cubed root. Well, to get rid of a cubed root, I can cube both sides. So 3 times 1 third is 1, x to the first. Well, what I do to one side, I do to the other. 4 cubed is 64. And if I check that in here, it will be a true statement. Because the cubed root of 64 is 4. 4 squared is 16. The cubed root of 64 is 4. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Minus 8 is 0, it checks out. This is one of my solutions. But since I had two values of u, I also have to substitute in that negative 2 for the u. And since u equals x to the 1 third, I have to solve this one as well. So again, to get rid of that cubed root or that 1 third power, I raise both sides to the third power. Here I get negative 8 equals x. Let's check that answer. The cubed root of negative 8 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is a positive 4. Here, if I take the cubed root of negative 8, 
That gives me negative 2. Negative 2 times a negative 2 is a positive 4. So I have 4 plus 4 minus this 8. That is, in fact, 0. So I have two solutions, and I checked them so I know they're right. If you use a substitution, make sure that you go back to this piece that you substituted in and find the value for x, because you didn't want u. So that's one method. It's called substitution. We're also going to use it here. And I'm going to do that same assessment. Is this term squared relative to that term? Well, let's find out. If I take y to the negative 1 half and I square it, well, if I multiply 2 times negative 1 half, I get y to the negative first power, which is that term. So I know that substitution will work with this equation. So let's do that substitution. Let u equal that middle term, y to the negative 1 half. Now, if I do that substitution, the first u is squared. Minus 12u plus 20 equals 0. And now I can simply solve it using quadratic methods. And again, I recognize there are factors of 20 that have a difference of 12. And that would be u minus 10 and u minus 2. Negative 10 times negative 2 is a positive 20. Negative 10 and negative 2 is a negative 12. So that is how it factors. And now I can use the zero factor theorem. And I get 10 and 2 as my solutions for u. But I want to find out what y is. So I'm going to take these values and put them back in. 10 equals y to the negative 1 half. And 2 equals y to the negative 1 half. Now, hopefully, we recall all those rules of exponents. A negative exponent just means it's reciprocal. And a fractional exponent just means a root. So I'm going to change this into a radical notation. 10 equals 1 over the square root of y. Now, to solve this, I can simply, well, let's get y out of the denominator, clear that fraction. I get the square root of y times 10. So I'm multiplying both sides by the square root of y equals 1. And now, to get this by itself, I divide by 10. The square root of y equals uh, 1 over 10. And then I can square both sides to get rid of this radical, this square root. And I get y equals 1 one hundred. One tenth squared is 1 one hundredth. So I found that value. And if I plug it back in and check it, it will work. But I'll leave that for you to try. We still have one other solution to find. So if this is the case, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to change this to a positive by putting it in a denominator. And I recognize that to just be the square root. Solve it the exact same way. And when I do that, multiply both sides by the square root of y, divide by 2, and square it, I get y equals 1 fourth. Check this one into the original equation and make sure it makes a true statement. It will make a true statement. So we have two solutions, y equals 1 fourth and y equals y 1 hundredth, or 1 1 hundredth. Try that yourself in checking it just to keep your math skills sharp. And uh, keep working. Keep doing the practice. This has been Section 7.4. Thank you for watching.